So, Trevor, these are very exciting times. Sounds uh, rather fine, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And it was. It was amazing. Um, you know, how amazing times we're in now uh, as regards the news agenda. But they're also very divisive times. And I want to start... In your book, you start with a quote from uh, a man called Roger Cohen, um, who's from the New York Times. New York Times. Mm -hmm. And he says, a journalist is a stranger who moves in the opposite direction from the crowd towards danger, leaving the settled majority perplexed. And, and I, I quote this because this is about social media, I think, now, today. And, um, and they say, why, they ask, uh, do you choose such a lonely existence? In search of a fair understanding, you say, and they shake their heads. There is nothing to understand, they insist. Just write the truth, but truths are many. And that is the problem. And that indeed yeah. is the problem because in today's day and age, if you don't ask the questions that they at home want asked, then you are in some way not one of them. You're unfair, you are biased, you're whatever. He gets it absolutely right, doesn't yeah. he? The, he does. The, the, so the truths are many. And, and the truths are many. people's perceptions of, of what is now truth is, is very difficult, you, you, you know. But, but um, I, I like the point he makes too about the strangeness of being a journalist, you know. Why do you go in this lonely direction, he asks. Um, and it is, it is very true. It's a strange, strange business. But, you but know, was it a business or a career that you had always dreamt of? When you I had were always young, dreamt of did you yeah, know I, you I, wanted to be I journalist. wanted to do it. Yeah. Um, but but I, I never ignored the fact that it was, you know, it, it was very, very odd. I remember I used to try to try to comfort my mother when I was in places like Beirut and, and so on. And I would always call her up and say, you know, if you heard about bombs and so on, it's all exaggerated, I'm absolutely fine. And she'd say, where, where are you? And I'd say, I'm in Beirut. And she'd say, but why? <laughs> yes. Which is what... But why, when you grew up in Trinidad and you're on an island there, what was it about you that said, I want to go out into the world and I have a mission to explore? Well, it, it wasn't, you know, that philosophically uh, arrived at, but it was, in, in more practical terms, I lived on a terribly small island, and small islanders are not introspective. They, they tend to look outward. Um, and so I saw the world. The, the world did affect us, you know, even in a, a distant remote island, what happened in America and what happened in Britain and what happened in Southeast Asia, all of which we had connections with. All that affected you. So I was interested in the world. And I listened to the BBC World Service and I heard people reporting from Moscow and from Johannesburg and from Mumbai and I thought, uh, this is not a bad life. And it did occur to me that somebody was paying their but travel to, to get there. You, I suppose to be a good journalist, you have to be inquisitive. So were you an Absolutely inquisitive right. child? You always yeah. had that. I was inquisitive and I also, I mean, it's very difficult sometimes going back with any accuracy on how true this is. But I always felt that there was a kind of importance in, in spreading the news, mm. in letting people know what, what was happening. This is the kind of information that people act on when they send people to Parliament and so on. Mm. Well, let me, let me... I can totally get that, totally understand that. And then for decades, of course, you are the recognisable, the most recognisable face in the UK for news that there is. But also... You become a celebrity. <laughs> how how well, did you? You didn't set out to be a celebrity. No, yeah. no. It shows you. But it's yourself. taken on that, that. That word has taken on some dimensions that I don't like. Yes. I'm, listen, I'm a I'm a hack. But who, the thing who, is, people who, like who read you. The news. People like you. But you present the National Television Award. Yeah. You're in, I, the, you're mixing I love that because yeah. whenever I drive past the Albert Hall now, I say to people, especially if they're you know a <laughs> black cab driver, I said. I used to play this place, you know, for 13 years. <laughs> They're all stunned and they think the old man is really losing it now. But um, <laughs> I remember, I remember many years ago when I was a, a young journalist starting out, uh, a, a taxi driver said to me, had that Trevor McDonald in here the other day? Yeah. And I said, had you, he's a nice guy. He is. I said, oh, that's yeah. good, that's good. He said, not what you would think, doesn't listen to Radio 4 or whatever. He puts on Heart FM. He wants to hear the music. He wants, he's, he's right down with it. He's, yes. Yeah, that, that, that's probably because I, that was the last guy I gave a good tip to. That. <laughs> you, you, you met the one guy I gave a tip to. <laughs> we saw in, in the, the film there all the amazing people that you interviewed during your career. Um, it's a tough question, I know, and hard, but was there a standout moment for you, a standout person? I really enjoyed meeting Nelson Mandela. N neither had anticipated what a scrum it was going to yeah. be. 
and um, we, we had to help them out and help mm. them out in our favour. So I got, the, <laughs> I got the first interview. And for many years you were based in, in my hometown of, of Belfast. I, I worked in Belfast and I, it gave me my start. It was horrifying for me in a way because I'd come from an island where I'd never heard a bomb go off before and I'd certainly never heard or seen a Uzi submachine gun or Kalashnikov. Mm. So it was all very strange and of course the violence was overpowering, and I'm a, a acknowledged coward, so it was not easy. But do you know, Eamon, it, it got me noticed. Mm. Um, and because Northern Ireland was the top story in those days every evening. Well, he was living there, and, watching and you were living you. there, and I was doing the top story ev every day. And you know, you will understand um, how, how obsessed we were in those days about what was going on in, in, in the province. So, um, you know, it's something I look back on. I think you give some really good insight as well um, when, when you talk about um, the, the, the then Prime Minister Terence O'Neill talking about the situation and Ian Paisley and all that sort of thing. I think, I think all yeah. that's very good. Why, final question, why when we sit and we take you for granted and you have been in our homes and you have done so much over the, the years, why was it, why do you call it an improbable life? Because I could never have written the script. I could never have imagined that uh, a, a young boy brought up in a tiny island in the Caribbean, 4,000 miles away, would end up sitting, being interviewed by you. I, I, <laughs> and, when you and when you went back to visit your parents on that tiny island, how, how, was your, how were they about your family? My father used to stand on the veranda. And when I, he would always insist that I take him for a drink. And we'd walk into the rum shop, which is the Trinidadian pub equivalent of, and, um, and, and he would say, He'd look around very proudly and say, um, my, my son is here from London and he'd come to buy you all a drink. <laughs> that was never my intention, by the way. I was going to did, buy my father a drink. Did he live he was, to see you knighted? Um, I, I, somebody asked me that uh, only recently. I, I don't think he... He, he lived to, to, to remember or to be told that... I, I hadn't actually bombed out in London that I had done reasonably well. You've done very reasonably well. Thank very you, Sir Trevor. Thank well. you. Thank you very much for having me. And a, and a very good read. Thank you very much Love indeed. Thank you. See you. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much.